This is the Mindful Cranks, and I am your host, Ron Purser. Could it be the case that Western Buddhists have lost touch with the radical questioning and the transformative power of transcendence? Has the focus on meditation and the mimicking of South Asian monastics with the necessity of engaging in long and austere silent retreats and the dominant materialist view that Buddhism is a science of mind created an ecology that is elitist and exclusionary? Will worshiping at the secular altar with its fMRI brain scans satisfy our yearnings for transcendence? Is stress reduction and neuro self-optimization and vague notions of individualistic happiness and so-called human flourishing among the secular Buddhists, is that all we can expect from Buddhist modernism? What if, rather than science and psychology, that the arts may be a more fruitful path and gateway for us in the West to engage with the transcendent, to rediscover our true nature, or what Paul Tillich called our infinite passions and the joy of creative communion. Rather than celebrating the mainstreaming of mindfulness as it has accommodated itself to the needs of capitalist ideology, can we engage in a politics of refusal and reclaim Buddhism as a countercultural force in the modern world? These thought-provoking questions are the subject of Curtis White's new book, Transcendent Art and Dharma in a Time of Collapse, published by Melville House. In this episode, Curtis White dives deep into these questions, showing us why the 60s counterculture was so open and receptive to Buddhism and why it felt so familiar, as if something lost was being returned to us. Curtis argues that our native traditions, from the English Romantic poets to the American Transcendentalist, were forms of social transcendence that opposed the alienating effects of rationalism, science, and industry. Social movements that were not only aesthetic, but liberative. Our conversation was wide-ranging, from trashing the Davos crowd to appreciating blues music to the wrathful compassion and performative enactment of comedy embodied by George Carlin, to the spiritual transcendence of a Vermeer painting. White shows us how our everyday world is where transcendence is always available and that we can play to be free and how art can model that freedom. Curtis White spent most of his career writing experimental fiction and was formerly a professor of English at Illinois State University. He is the author of 16 books including such titles as Living in a World That Can't Be Fixed, The Science Delusion, We Robots. His essays have appeared in Harper's Magazine, Salon, The Village Voice, Tricycle, Orion, and In These Times. His newest book, Transcendent Art and Dharma in a Time of Collapse, was published by Melville House 2023. Curtis White, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Yeah, our mutual friend over Tricycle, Andy Cooper, is a big fan of yours, and that's how I heard about your work a couple of years back, well, going back further than that even, and and then we started communicating via email and some interesting synchronicities, like you used to live in Pacifica, where I reside. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, Andrew. Andrew is a great guy. I, I respect him so much that I, I I wouldn't think of calling him Andy. He's Andrew. Okay, Andrew Cooper. 
if you're listening. <laughs> and uh, I think you're a bit older than me, uh, uh, a bit, maybe. Mm. How old are you? 72. Hmm. Okay. I'm 67. And you, you grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. I grew up in what they call a, it was a post-war vet village. Uh, you know, housing, you know, it was basically like Levittown, uh, actually Levittown based its housing, you know, its architecture and stuff, uh, home building process on what was called at that time, the California method. And San Lorenzo was the first of those little ticky tacky stucco homes. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I've been there maybe once just driving through. Yeah. I don't I got get to out. the east. Yeah. <laughs> thanks to thanks to San Francisco and the counterculture, I got out. Man, I remember laughing and running. And I looked at your Wikipedia page, I glanced at it. I don't know if I if I counted correctly, but your new book, Transcendent Art and Dharma in a Time of Collapse, is your sixteenth book? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's so just incredible. Yeah. As, as I was reading the introduction, I was I was I was taken aback by when you were describing how the path, the Buddhist path, opened up for you in the early '80s, because another synchronicity is that you actually mentioned the book that I studied, the Time, Space, and Knowledge in the yeah, Vision of Reality. Tarthank Tuku. Tarthank Tuku. I know it's been over what 40, 40 years ago at least. And but do you remember what your response to that book was? Because you do mention it in Transcendent. Well, you know, uh, one thing one thing that I really remember from Tartank Toku is the phrase, life is the play of energy in the void. And so, oh. yeah, so I really liked the way that he brought play into the study. And uh, because at that time, I was very much a fiction writer in the sort of postmodern mold, which was really not postmodern at all. It went. It went back to the great play, playful fiction writers of the, of the 17th and 18th century, people like Lawrence Stern, and uh, Dennis Diderot, who wrote a book called Jacques the Fatalist, and uh, Rabelais. They were they were not realist storytellers at all. They were they were in praise of play. So that was one thing, but the other thing that really attracted me was the fact that he he was he talked some about emptiness. Sure, and I'd never heard that particular concept before. But I, uh, I was more or less re- very recently out of grad school in in the late seventies, and where you know I studied uh, the the uh, French post structuralists a lot, and the concept of emptiness and and Jacques Derrida's concept of deconstruction. Uh, are very close. Mm-hmm. In fact, somebody wrote a book called uh, Derrida and the Men, and it was about Nargarjuna, the Buddhist oh. philosopher wow. uh, of emptiness, and and Derrida. Huh. It wasn't a very good book, but still, you know, somebody yeah, well, else other than myself saw the saw, that, yeah. <coughs> yeah. saw the parallel. So you went on to become an English professor, right? You know what else was I going to do? <laughs> Well, that's an endangered species nowadays. It absolutely is. Uh, uh, even, you know, English majors. Yeah, no, the humanities in general. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, the uh, high-tech capitalism is really mostly responsible. There was and just an course, article in the New York Times today about the loss of English majors across the country. It's well, that's been lot. going on for a long time. Mm. You know, it's been a long slow slide into nothing really but mm-hmm. uh, part of it is you know uh the situation for anybody going to college now unless you know they're really come from wealth is that they're told in order to get a good job you have to go to college if right. you go to college you'll take on debt and the only way you'll be able to pay off that debt is if you get a job where we want you to get a job you know, and even then, you're paying it off for decades. In the STEM uh, departments STEM. and business Absolutely. schools, of it's course. All STEM. Right. Science, technology, engineering, and math. Mm-hmm. Well, you make a very interesting point early on in, in the book that you said that the Dharma gave you a place to stand. Mm-hmm. And when I read that sentence, I was like, Whoa. hmm, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Uh, well, you know. It 
it, w- it wasn't instantaneous. I'll tell you uh-huh. that. You know, the yeah, path is sure. long. So, you, but it was, uh, but it, you know, it, it just felt like I was finding myself when I started uh, studying Buddhism, and especially, you know, I was kind of dived in at the deep end of the pool with the concept of end- emptiness. I read a book by Frederick Strang, oh, the, sure. uh, the great Buddhist sco- scholar, called Emptiness. Right. Uh, a philosophical concept or something like that. That's a pretty uh, deep end to start out with. Yeah, and I just, but you see, I was so well prepared for it by, you know, my study of philosophy, Western philosophy, especially mm-hmm. the post structuralists, that I just loved that book, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's so totally out of print. You can't find a copy anywhere. You can get a PDF, but that's it. Mm. Mm. And I have to say that. Uh, your book it was a joy to read and hard to put down, and you're you're a master essayist. That's the sort of writing that I aspire to, and it's clear, it's engaging, it's lively, it's humorous, it's contemporary, it's vigorously argued, and uh, there's a fearlessness uh, to your voice in the writing, and uh, <laughs> or indifference. <laughs> well, no, I, I don't know <laughs> indifference to, to what other people think. You know, I know, okay. I you know. You know, as I'm writing, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very well aware that that uh, very, very few, if any, commercial publishing houses are going to are going to touch it because it's just too free. Mm-hmm. So it's a very unconventional book. Um, parts of it are pretty straightforward, sort of social critique, um, and uh, that's the first section of a book called Delusion, which is about. Uh, the main chapter there is called Beyond the Database Buddha. Mm-hmm. And then the middle section is called Insight. And I begin to develop ways of thinking about transcendence there because the book is not about Buddhism. It's about transcendence. That's right. The middle. So I, I have um, three ways of thinking about transcendence that I describe in the book. Uh, one is everyday transcendence. And that is, you know, the things that we experience every day that we just take for granted but that are really, we don't have any idea what we're doing. I mean, if you said, yeah, if I said, Ron, what, what's love or what's beauty? You would say, you, what? <laughs> you wouldn't know what to say. But you're, you wouldn't be, you, uh, people who don't have those things in their lives are not, in my opinion, fully human. So, but, the, you know, people would say, I love my children, I love other people, I love nature, and they don't really know what they're saying. Therefore, they're working in a kind of metaphysic, with a everyday metaphysics, is one way of putting it. The second I'm kind glad of- you said that. I'm glad you clarified that, because I think a lot of people would, when they hear the word transcendent, might misinterpret that to mean yeah. otherworldly. Yeah. That, um, well, we're it trying is to other, see- even that kind is otherworldly. You know what well, I'm saying? Okay. You know, uh, extraordinary. You know, extraordinary. Right. I mean, it's not like somebody invented love. It's not like we can explain it by body mechanics or biomechanics or whatever, genetics. We don't know what we're talking about. The word love is a placeholder. It means many different things and what depends upon the context. But we all feel, we all sense that there's a place ultimately where it is real. Yeah, I think I think where I was going with that is that there is a strand, a very strong one, a dominant one, so-called secular Buddhists that would would say that well, you're not, you know, when you say the word transcendent, it sounds like you're not concerned with this life, you know. You've heard that. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I mean that's the, that's where the so-called secular Buddhists get started. That's their their first gesture is to make transcendent sound like something about. That has to do with bodhisattvas floating around on lotus leaves in in, in the stratosphere, you know. Exactly. But that's not what it is at all. That's a right. silly way of that's a silly way of thinking about transcendence, and especially a silly way of thinking about transcendence in the context of Buddhism. Yeah, and, and there's a part of that strand of secular Buddhism is a Stoic uh, Buddhist Stoicism, where it's like, well, you know, we're trying to achieve mundane happiness, you know, happiness in this life, well-being. And, and a term that I, I'm really fed up with, I mean, maybe we can kind of talk about this, is human flourishing. Yeah, Human flourishing is the golden phrase among the strand of, yeah. of Western Buddhist. Yeah. You have a passage, actually, in Transcendent 
when I read it, I said, yes. Mm -hmm. Would you mind reading that? It's not that Buddhism is indifferent to flourishing, but when Buddhism encourages flourishing, it does so through the idea that in order to flourish, we must move through awareness, especially awareness of the fact that we do not flourish in the world as it stands, in samsara, under capital. We flourish only when we leave that world, when we reject the causes and conditions that first formed us, the karma stream, the varied miseries of Western culture, especially the miseries that techno-capitalism, Facebook most notoriously, has dropped upon us. We will truly flourish only when we awaken, when we take refuge in awareness, when we free ourselves from the world that we were born into, and when we change the way we live. We will flourish only when we end delusion, including the delusions of new atheist materialists. Now, that is a substantial way to understand flourishing. Yes, I agree. <laughs> And, and 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 so when you say like transcendent comes about through the everyday, it reminds me of the Zen saying ordinary mind is the way mm-hmm. too. And yeah. would you equate that transcendence is kind of resonant with the sacred then? This- with the sacred? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. With spirit. There's a lot of words that we use to sort of, it's metaf- it is metaphysical, you know. Well, what do we mean by transcendent? It uh ultimately you know, it kind of depends on the context. Uh, it depends what we're talking about. But there is a medical, metaphysical dimension to it because we don't really know uh, what we mean when we say something is transcendent. In many ways, it's uh, it's something that we have to experience first to really recognize. You know, when you recognize love as love or beauty as beauty, that's that's a transcendental gesture. The other kind of transcendence that I talk about a good deal in the book is social transcendence. Right. And, uh, and Buddhism is is a prophetic force when it goes against the, the mainstream. It, it's always against the stream of the world. <laughs> going against anybody, the stream is not, a Zen way of seeing things, going against the stream. Yeah, but of course, that's all forgotten in- Topos, I don't know how to pro- if I'm pronouncing it, but it meant uh, out of place, mm. that- uh, the true love well, of wisdom was an untimely critic. Yeah, that well, was Plato. Of, yeah, that Plato and that whole and the whole tradition that uh, he began through Plotinus and the Neoplatonists and the Gnostics. Um, there was the the assumption that this isn't the real world. The world that we live in is not the real world. It's a it's a it's a the world of the good. So let's get into your book a little more. It seems that. One of the main things you're proposing is that we can recover Buddhism's countercultural force, not by turning to science, but to art and what you refer to as spiritually transcendent art. Why is that? Why, Why art? The question I ask in the book is, is not what is transcendent so much as why were we so open to Buddhism when it arrived on our shores, uh, beginning with D.T. Suzuki in the 50s and then later Shunru Suzuki and Dzogchen. Uh, and my answer to that is that you know, it really Buddhism was happening at very, uh, back in those days at very elite levels of the culture, going back to uh, the theosophists, etc., Mm-hmm. Which is with it, which were drawing from all of the Eastern traditions and influencing poets like Rilke and uh, W. B. Yeats, and of course all the Swedenborgians. That uh, William James's father was a Swedenborgian. Um, uh, so there were lots of Eastern inflected ways of thinking in the United States and Europe at that time, um, but they were at very elite levels of the culture, right? Eventually, through the counterculture in the 60s, those, it, it became a much more common thing. It became accessible to people who had no money, right? Mm-hmm. Like the hippies. The hippies, yeah. The, in, the insight meditation people in Massachusetts, they, are, they were all the first generation, the first you know, boatload of people to go over to Thailand and, uh, and Tibet and study Buddhism. And they were all basically penniless. They got over there and they had no money at all. That is no longer the case, I might point out to you, but 
But, uh, you know, I mean, Buddhism became open to ordinary, very ordinary people in the United States. And my question is, what did they recognize in it? It can't have been completely alien to them. And what they recognized in it, I think, was our, our own transcendental or spiritual traditions for us, which goes for me back to William Blake and the Romantics, and especially mm -hmm. the German Romantics uh, philosophers like Bling. Mm -hmm. But uh, they created the first counterculture. I mean, Romanticism was a counterculture. You know, you think about Wordsworth and Coleridge, they were Keats. They were all dying to get out of the world they were born into, you know, because uh, the, the roles uh, in the class roles in England were very well defined at that time. And they said, you know, I'm, we're going to invent a new kind of role in this culture. And it's going to be called the poet with a capital P. I mean, there was poetry before, but there wasn't like a job description of I'm a poet. You know, yeah, you know, so they were they were in open rebellion socially for, with their culture, and uh, so they declared their freedom and they started thinking differently as well. They began thinking like counterculturalists, for example, um, Coleridge and the, the poet Robert Southey um, actually planned and uh, to create a utopian community in the United States. They mm. got as close as just about buying. Uh, I think it was going to be in Illinois, too, where there were a number of utopian communities in the 19th century in Illinois. His wife, Mary Shelley, uh, were doing much the same sort of thing in Italy. You know, Wordsworth with his lake country uh, refuge with his, his uh, sister, Dorothy. They, and once they, they declared their freedom, found themselves a different world and a different way to live. And then they began really inventing the substance, the theoretical substance of what they were doing. And that, that had an awful lot to do with our identity with nature. Yes. You know, yes. not that, not that, not that we're, that we're looking at, uh, you know, it's not pantheistic. We're not seeing right. gods in nature. We're saying, I am nature. I'm mm -hmm. part of nature. It was an intimacy, uncontrived intimacy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, um, that had been percolating in the West for a long time when, uh, when Buddhism arrived on our shores in, in a definitive way. I mean, yeah, there, there, were, there were Asian American communities where Buddhism existed, but when, when Buddhism moved into the dominant culture, it was uh, directly an import. It, was, it wasn't working out of the communities, which is not either good or bad. It's just the way it happened. So that's why Buddhism seems so familiar to the beats right. and the hippies. Right. Exactly. It was almost that, that wait a minute, that we're, something's being returned to us or, or we're, right. we're discovering. Um, right. It, that's how it felt to me. It was like, where's this been? I know mm -hmm. what this is. I'm familiar with this. But, you know, to me, the romantic tradition uh, of the arts and, and the spirit was only uh, 150 years old. <laughs> Buddhism has had millennia to develop itself. And right. Buddhism is just, for me, I mean, I love the arts, the Western arts, and I see them as a gateway to Buddhism. A but gateway, Buddhism yes. is just so much more complete. It's really a world you can live in. Uh, one thing you were talking about is that it wasn't just an aesthetic. It was liberatory. It was a yeah. liberative movement. And one of the concepts that they developed was estrangement. Estrangement, yeah, that's a, a theory of Viktor Shlavsky, who was a, ru a so-called Russian formalist. And uh, basically, estrangement is a sort of responsibility of the artist to uh, to take to renew things that have become stale. So you habitual. know, habitual, habitual, mm -hmm. yeah, familiar, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So you know, you look if you look at a tree and only see a, another tree. <laughs> or board feet, you know, how many board feet are in that tree and what's its market value. Um, you're not looking at the thing. And so what Shlavsky and Estrangement did basically was to say, we need, we need to re-inhabit the world. We need to inhabit the world in a new way that allows it to be uh, the living thing, the fresh thing, the immediate thing that it is. And 
I went back and looked um, uh, and among the prose writings of the Romantics, the early Romantics, and uh, ex the exact same idea that Shlodsky came up with in the late, in the early 19th, uh, 20th century, uh, the very same idea is, was present everywhere, really, in, in the Romantic writings. Uh, Keats's, John Keats had a famous series of letters, and he, he, in one of his letters, he writes about seeing a sparrow outside of his window. And he and he 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 writes that he became one with the sparrow, and he was pecking around with the sparrow, you know. So the that sparrow became very particular for for Keats, you know. It wasn't just a sparrow in general or an, another bird; it was the sparrow, and he was part of it. A very Buddhist thought. I'd like to go back because you talk also about the importance of understanding. Buddhist ecologies, and that they're very qualitatively different. For example, an ecology within neoliberal capitalist order or within a scientific sort of zeitgeist is very different than the romantic ecology right. that you were talking about or an artistic ecology. Right. Well, I, I concede to the secularists the idea that when Buddhism comes into another culture, it's it's going to have to meet that culture in some sort of meaningful way. Yes. And what I'm uh -huh. saying is that in the West, uh, Buddhism can meet Western culture through the arts and not betray itself. You know, I mean, they're they're basically on the same ground. They're different. You know, but they're they're also a lot the same. In the East, Chinese poetry, etc. You know that they, they were also uh, you know early Chan or Zen. Uh, Buddhism was was very much, uh, you know, thinking of, about and using poetry as a, as a vehicle for enlightenment. So it I, seems like historically that when we began to have the encounter of, of Buddhism with the West, it its early promoters were Buddhism as a science, as a science of mind. The scientific Buddha Donald yeah. Lopez has a great book on that, the history of yeah, that cultural that translation. And he kind of put me on the trail. Donald Lopez. Yeah, he yeah. And all the biggest promoters of mindfulness, for example, John Kabat Zinn, they, they liken the Buddha to a great scientist like Galileo or Einstein. Right. That and you've heard the trope and 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 that we should all be celebrating uh because mindfulness is now or Buddhist meditation is now gone mainstream and science has proven its utility. But you aren't celebrating that mainstreaming no. of mindfulness. Well, you could put it that way, or you could say science is call, trying to colonize yet again uh, something that isn't like it. But that's an example of a different ecology that you're speaking of. Right. No, that's a, a colonialist ecology. And I mean, for different reasons, different but similar reasons, capitalism and, uh, and science dislike it seeing something near it that is unlike it. So for uh, that's the ideological function of capitalism is to is to take those things that are unlike it and make it like it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean it, it, everything has to look like capitalism. Everything has to affirm and it does that by co-opting it. It brings it within the capitalist order. So you've got Google and a Amazon and book to a degree all all doing having these Buddhist programs, and now you know uh, meditation and mindfulness and yoga is in. I would hazard to guess most uh, of the larger corporations. Right, that brings up the point of what it means to be countercultural, because it seems that in your other book, living in a world that can't be fixed, right. you make a point that we have a very limited understanding of what culture is. And that culture isn't just movies and it's just not cuisines and customs that it's really a, an affirmation of life mm -hmm. and it goes beyond politics. I like how you referenced Freud who stated that culture is the act of replacing what is unconscious with what is conscious mm -hmm. and that capitalism is a cult, as you put it, mm -hmm. uh, that's unconscious. It's mm -hmm. not culture, it's a cult. When I yeah. when I read that, your work reminded me of of Mark Fisher's work on capitalist realism, mm, right? And that it's easier to imagine the the end of the world than the end of capitalism. 
Well, you know, as a, as a fiction writer and an artist, uh, I feel that very directly because I am not a realist. But if I want to get published uh, by a commercial press, a, a New York press, you know, all four of them that are remaining in New York, I'd better be somewhere near uh, the social realism, you know, and capital or capitalist realism. I'd better be in there somewhere. And uh, to me, that's just like the death of the novel. You know, every it was a big the death of the novel in, in the in the sixties and seventies was a big theme. Um, but uh, capitalism is doing its best to to make it uh, factual. You know. Not, the novel is dead because nobody's free. And and if it, somebody makes the mistake of being free, they can't get published. Yeah. And you say most art today isn't really art, that it's really an expression of a cult. Right. Or, you know, it's a, if you can think of capitalism as a cult, it, 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 you could also talk about it in terms of ideology, right? There's a philosopher that I liked very much. It was very influential for me, a French philosopher named Paul Ricoeur. And he basically divided narrative literature into two parts. One was utopic and one was ideological. So we have all of almost all of our literature now now is ideological in one way or another. Very little of it is really free um, and utopic. So, you know, the function of the artist is to uh, be free to make things and in the process create an alternative reality. And an internal alternative reality that is, you know, we can think about inhabiting literally. <laughs> Which happened, how many, how many times in our history, you know, the West Bank in Paris, the East Village, the hate, uh, you know, Taos, uh, all of these sort of enclaves of artists were saying, you know, this is where this is how art tells us to live. Yeah, it's very interesting that I, I've been thinking about this after reading your book. It kind of made me think a little bit about if that if the arts, the arts may be an undeveloped gateway for us in the West to engage with the transcendent and to rediscover our true nature uh, and express that true nature through right. creative expressions, through performance. So my question is, could it be the case that the West is really fooling itself in some ways in terms if it thinks that meditation, which was a practice that was traditionally and historically supported by a very different Buddhist ecological system, and a system based on monasteries and monastics, right. which required lifelong training with very intense and comprehensive contemplative education systems. Can the West really cultivate a Buddhist counterculture by expecting Westerners to sequester themselves no. in intensive and long-term meditative practices to sit alone in like long 10-day austere silent retreats, which were imported really from Burma and Thailand. Right. Uh, well, you know, I think we can get away with 10-day uh, meditation retreats, but the idea that that Western Buddhism is going to be uh, mainly a function of monasteries is, I think, not a good idea. The, the nice thing that I think um, the West brings to Buddhism is that it's, it, it hybridizes Buddhism. It sort of has an, a, a buffet approach uh, to Buddhism. They say, you know, we're, we see the commonalities between these various traditions, you know, whether the, the Tibetan or the Theravadan or the Mahayana, the Zen. We, we see the commonalities between them because they're not hard to find. They're there, you know. And so we want to bring them all together. And really, that's uh, Joseph Goldstein had a very good uh, book called uh, One Dharma in which he talked about Buddhism in the West as being uh, this place where uh, the, at long last, you know, the historical Eastern versions of Buddhism had a chance to meet each other and, uh, and grow, grow together. But that doesn't mean homogenizing uh, no. everything into one sort of um, mush, right? No. <laughs> no, there we got to go with uh, 
Tartang Toku and sort of say, no, it's, it's, uh, we're all together now to play. Well, let's shift gears and talk about, I love this chapter, <laughs> the Davos men. And I think we equally share a very deep disgust towards this elitist group that, uh, uh, the, for those that know, that don't know, the annual meetings of the World Economic Forum meet, what, in February in Davos, Switzerland. Right. And I took aim at, in McMindfulness, I took aim at mindfulness cheerleaders who have been showing up at Davos over the last four or five years, preaching the mindfulness gospel to right. uh, the Davos men, and with the promise it'll transform them into kinder, gentler thieves, I guess. I think that what's happening is uh, what's happening, and it's happened so quickly, I mean, if you consider 20 years quickly, but very very steadily within that 20 year period is that Buddhism is becoming a class privilege. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a, to me, that's a very sobering thing because I come from a working class background. I, I, you know, I never, I never made a lot of money as a, even when I was a professor. Um, so do I. I'm blue collar family. Yeah. Chicago yeah. South side, by the way. So, you know, I would, I would frankly, personally even though I'm, I'm certainly a member of that class now, if you look at my at my, you know, income status, I would be very uncomfortable at uh, at at these things. You know, like a TED Talk type thing. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you to me, uh, and a lot of a lot of Buddhist uh, Buddhist talkers uh, show up at TED. You know, and. Uh, and you kind of go, what is what is Buddhism doing? It has no place there, you know. Buddhism, the Buddha was uh, lived on alms for God's sake under trees. <laughs> so what do you got to do with Buddhism? That's really, I mean, it's part a large part of the reason that I, I guess I wandered into this territory because you know I'm not a a Dharma talker and I'm not a, a an expert uh, in. Um, Eastern religions, but, you know, I spent 40 years with it, sort of living with it. And I, I resented and, you know, felt personally offended by, by uh, some of the things I saw happening in corporations or with stress-based mindfulness. I felt, I felt really a, kind of assaulted. <laughs> you I know? know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, you know, it's like... Uh, wow. <laughs> Talk about cultural appropriation. This is even cultural appropriation of our own, of our Western culture, you know, and that, well, of course, they've always done, they've always done that. Both science and capitalism have always attempted to eliminate, or it began with the philosopher Auguste Comte in the late 19th century. He was the first positivist philosopher. Mm. And he described human history in three periods. The first period was religion. The second period was metaphysics. And the third period was science. And by third period, he meant third and final. Mm -hmm. Completely, you know. The end of history. We, he meant it in terms of we don't need religion anymore. and We don't meet, need metaphysics anymore. We don't need the transcendental another anymore. And, uh, of course, uh, out of that came neopositivism and... Uh, the hard sciences, uh, which Comte wasn't, but Bertrand Russell and Einstein, and and then um, <clears throat> analytic philosophy, which is the the species we've had in universities for the last fifty years, seventy years. I don't know, but it's all about logic now. It's all about logic and uh, empiricism. You make a strong point in this chapter too that. That capitalism is always kind of promoting that it can fix itself, it, that it can reform itself. And in this case, uh, mindfulness is part of that solution of, of that reform of capitalism. Is. But you, you also make a really cool point about uh, how the global elite class is kind of living in the God realm. Yeah, right. <laughs> On the Tibetan wheel of life. Yeah, the God realm. Uh, that's and that, right. And that ordinary I mean, folks like... Or, Ordinary folks like us are like uh, something they heard about. That's the way you put it. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, we're quite unreal to them. Um, 
you know, absolutely. The people at, at, at Davos, you know, when do they walk among us, you know, ordinary people in this country? You know, they're, the people that they're likely to, to know are, uh, you know, the people in the next yacht over, you know, just floating out there in, in their magnificence, if not munificence. All they know is people from their own class. Speaking of yachts, that's the image we saw. As you also pointed out in the book during the COVID pandemic, oh yeah, the right. contrast between those uh, people on the yachts and the essential so workers. Sure. Right, I make a very rather bitter joke about how social distancing worked for the rich. Right, and that the pandemic was kind of exposing the dark underbelly to just what extent the global elite would sacrifice uh, sacrifice lives. Um, yeah. You know, actually, uh, one of uh, Putin's conspiracy theories that, about the West at the present is I think it, I think it's called the one billion theory, the conspiracy theory, and that is that the West once reduced the world population to one billion, which would be basically the uber wealthy and its protected class, you know, the top 10%, say, of world population. So do capitalists worry about whether or not climate change is going to have a terrible effect upon Africa, which it certainly is, and uh, the migration and the mass starvation that it's likely to cause? It wouldn't appear so. I don't think, I, you know, Putin's theory is kind of attractive to me because um, I can easily imagine them saying, well, you know, uh, I'm going to stay where I am up here in the God realm. Uh, I think my chances are best up here. And in the meantime, I'm just going to continue to do what I've always done, which is which is a pursue profit. Well, that kind of reminds me of the latest is the bunker uh, mentality, where they're mm. building bunkers. Oh, my God, yeah. Uh, and the, 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 their, their biggest worry is uh, how will they pay their bodyguards if our currency You're is right. wrong? Exactly. <laughs> Dollar is worthless. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I read an article somewhere about a guy that they had recruited to tell them, you know, what he asked them, you know, he came in uh, and he thought they were going to talk to him about, I forget what it was, his specialty. And they said, no, we just want to talk to you about how we're going to have uh, security guards uh, in our bunkers that won't kill yeah. us. That, I think that was Douglas Rushkoff. Who, uh, yeah. I think it was an article in Current Affairs recently. Yeah, I didn't read it there, but yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. And I, I just said, yes, that's exactly true. Uh, and I sort of hope that, yeah, you know, if everything goes the way you're thinking right now, I hope they do kill you. I wish they'd kill you now, <laughs> your security <laughs> guards. I say, I, I say that uh, in all good humor, folks. <laughs> what what happened during the pandemic during COVID nineteen that really kind of put into question the, the whole relationship between work and money? Um, well, you, you, the, you know, it was um, it was a sort of a phenomenon of the of the first uh, months and year of the of the pandemic, uh, which was that suddenly the money had no relationship. For a lot of people, had no relationship to work at all. It was, uh, you know, helicopter money, as I think they called it. It was just being dropped down on people in the form of, uh, you know, they were getting unemployment checks that were more than they were making when they were working, right? And that sort of thing. So uh, what I what I was sort of uh, investigating was this idea that um, uh, if people were thinking, you know, they would have seen that they could have seen that. Uh, the old idea that money uh, or va money value is based upon work or, you know, so much money for so much work, the value theory of money, that that was bunkum. That was yeah. always, it was a confident, it was a confidence trick from the beginning, you know. Right. Me um, meanwhile, meanwhile, you know, the corporations are, are expropriating the, the, uh, the, uh, the benefits of the, the profits of the work that the working class is already doing. And then we saw the this, this so-called great resignation, quiet quitting, 20-year-olds uh, in China that were just lying flat, doing nothing, even in China. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, and then the HR human resource professionals, though, you know, they come swooping in and they, they, they kind of reframe it as, oh, that's employee disengagement. 
and uh, they're not engaged enough. So now we have a a life coaching industry of life coaches and career coaches and business coaches. And we have to whip whip them, you know, into into shape. And, uh, you know, they're not resilient enough. They're languishing. That's yeah. the that's the new term. Really? Employees, they're not quite mentally ill, but they're not self optimizing either. They're kind of in this self optimizing. Uh, Good yeah. God! <laughs> yeah, that's because that's because they're bored and alienated from who they really are, and they right. they they got snookered into this career uh, path, and from the very beginning when they had to pick a major in college, you know. Or I guess I'll go into technology or computer science or something. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to pay these debts. So when they're able to sit at home and see their kids, walk their dog, go out in nature, yeah, uh, you know, I think uh, they started to think a little bit about uh, about uh, the real purpose of uh, yeah, another yeah. great awakening mm-hmm. opposed to the great resets. Schwab's great reset is it's a it's a lie. There's there's nothing going to get re- reset unless it's a, a, a resetting that meets the needs of uh, technology and the yeah, tech I, se- sector. Every year, they when they come together in, in Davos, they make all these sort of grand promises, and they sound so benevolent. You know, they're a global commitment to reducing carbon emissions, to ESG. Like you say, to me, it's like a big PR stunt. Right. right. Well, they, they, you know, and then they invite Matt Damon or someone in, you know, who everybody likes Matt Damon to sort of help them with the pitch. Even if Matt Damon doesn't know he's doing that, he's doing that. <laughs> right. Right. So let's talk about George Carlin. I, I, mm-hmm. I really had, had fun reading that. And I, I didn't expect to see that pop up in the book. And uh, yeah. I was just fascinated by this chapter. And, and, you, you you make an interesting observation that Stephen Colbert, mm-hmm. for some reason, he saw Carlin as as nihilistic. But that for you, that was a misreading of Carlin completely. Wait. How many how many people in the West have have concluded over the years, over the centuries, really, that Buddhism was nihilistic? That's yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, that's basically what they said, uh, and um, uh, you know, I mean. Carlin, in a, in, through his own kind of caustic humor, was pointing out some of the things that uh, Buddhism likes to point out. The ego you think you are doesn't actually exist. Uh, what And what you're going to suffer inevitably, whatever your condition, whatever the realm is that you live in, is aging, sickness, and death. So you need to learn how to die. You need to figure out some way of looking at all this, the peculiar reality of, of non-ego and um, and all the suffering that that's bringing to you. You need to find a way of looking at that. And uh, Carlin, because, well, you know, he was a little hyperbolic about it. He, he, he was a little hyperbolic about it. Went to, he went to some extremes, but God damn it. He was, uh, he, was onto, he was onto something there, you know, in terms of just sort of saying, wake up. You know, wake up, look around. <laughs> yeah, he took aim basically at our collective forgetting. Like we were suffering from social amnesia of some kind, and he was like trying to, uh, uh, like you said, wake us up. Right. Well, you know, it wasn't that long. You know, when Carlin got his start, it was at the, sort of the tail end of the high 60s and the, the counterculture. And uh, it was possible to think at that point that, uh, waking up was something that was going to going to happen. Um, I think that mo- most of his disillusionment came uh, in the end of his career because he real what he began to realize is that uh, whatever he did, however hard he worked, uh, there weren't in, there there weren't very many people like him, and he wasn't going to be he, this. What he hoped for wasn't going to come, and so he got a little he got a little uh, dark about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, he got dark in a way that really got a lot of people's attention. And what else is, what else can he do? What, what can I do? What can you do? I mean, we write our books, uh, they're totally ignored basically, um, by the corporate, uh, press. And, uh, 
much to my surprise with this book, I've discovered that every, what everybody now takes for granted, except for me, that, that there is no review media in this country, book review media in this country anymore. It just doesn't exist. And if you if you want to if you want to let people know you've got this book out there, and it's not going to be through uh, reviews in the local newspaper. It's going to be by going on Ron Purser's podcast program. <laughs> yeah, that that got me thinking a bit too. And you, you, I think you mentioned in living in a world that can't be fixed. But right. yeah, you make this point about commodifying our dissent, and that we really don't have any choice. It's it's uh, like you just said. Right. Uh, it's it's not it's not selling out. It's not uh, it's not a bad thing because right. it's going to be commodified, whether well, you like it or not. You know, um, you you make me think. Um, uh, Carlin uh, was certainly a celebrity. Yeah, you know, he could yeah. he could fill an auditorium. So he he was uh, he was sort of in that game. But the thing that's admirable about uh, especially the late Carlin uh, is that. Uh, he made it as difficult as he possibly could for him to be a successful celebrity. Hmm. He just, he just, uh, uh, he said, "You think this is funny, but you also realize at some level that uh, I'm talking about you and your relationship to the to the dominant culture." Uh, and so, you know, what he was ultimately asking people to do was to examine it. What is your relationship to the dominant culture? If, in what ways do you contribute to things that are, you know, would be unthinkable on their own terms? And it's, it is that honesty uh, about comedy uh, when it's true. It it it, it sometimes can hurt, but uh, it's right. uh, there is that transmutation of, of sorts. Yeah. And it reminds me of the blues, right? Uh, another now, there's an American art form that. Mm -hmm. uh, embraces suffering uh, but uh, there's an alchemy or a transmutation right through the expression i'm, I'm mm -hmm. a big blues guy mm. uh. <laughs> yeah yeah and you I have know, a whole I... chapter on music too by the way in this yeah. book which was I, yeah i think i have well music's kind of all, all over the place in the book but i have two two chapters uh um that are specifically about music uh one is called music's music um, as if, you know, there's music and then there's capital M music, as if we were talking about, you know, Dharma and big D Dharma. Um, <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know, mu the thing about music is, you know, to return to transcendence is that everybody has had a transcendental experience with music. Everybody has been, yep. you know, just about even, you know, Maybe not the lowest of musical forms, but basically everybody's had a moment when they were brought to tears by music. When that when music told them something that was so true, they had no other emotional response to it or any intellectual response to it other than tears. You know, and at those at those moments, you're going. I had I had, uh, I was listening. Uh, this was a year or so ago to Elvis Costello and uh, the Brodsky String Quartet's uh, Juliet Letters. And that album is so unknown, but at the same time is so beautiful. And uh, I was listening to it on headphones sitting on the floor, and I just started crying at one point. And, you know, my wife came over and said, what's wrong? And I said, uh, and she said, are you depressed? And I said, no, I'm not depressed at all. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I've just, this music just takes me somewhere. And uh, I don't know exactly where it is, but it's it's uh, it it's all in the music. It's not in the lyrics. It's just something about the the you know the 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 noise of music that can get at people in a in a profound way. And it's it's of all the arts the most accessible. I think something like it happens with all the arts, with uh, especially with uh, painting and with poetry. But even you know even uh, uh, you know. Narrative literature can do the same thing, although it has to work harder at it, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, have you come across or seen Rick Rubin's new book called "The Creative Act: A Way of Being"? Rick Rubin, no. a famous—he's a famous music producer in the music industry. 
no. quite a profound book. It just came out, and it's almost like the, a Taoist approach to art as a way of being, basically. Yeah. It's, it's quite good. Well, and, um, it, uh, it, you know, I mean, it, this was something that the German philosopher Schopenhauer understood. He, he argued that music is metaphysics or philosophy when you don't know you're doing philosophy. And it's, he, for him, it was the purest form of philosophy because it, it told you exactly what you wanted to know. And he was thinking I here, uh, you know, obviously of classical music at the time, but it tells you exactly what you want, you've always wanted to know with maybe not even knowing you wanted to know it about what is real. Mm. Yeah, you do make a very interesting uh, kind of observation uh, of a Vermeer painting in the book. Uh-huh. Which, how, you know, usually we're living, you know, the map and the territory metaphor. We're usually living in our habitual conceptual maps of reality, mm-hmm. very conditioned mm-hmm. by our karma. Or, but somehow when you look at great art or listen to big M music, as you put it, there's this brief glimpse of the territory. Right. Uh, and somehow that's something more or that extraordinary moment of clarity it has that freedom there's a freedom from those map from the maps right how do you sustain that is that a, is that just a glimpse or is this something we can integrate well in many ways it has been integrated you know it's not certainly not something that the dominant culture wants people thinking about too much but we're all familiar with it and uh, in some ways we're all in a state of perpetual mourning because it, it's kept at such a distance from us. Do you think that's why psychedelics were made illegal? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been asked about psychedelics a number of times and that sort of, you know, doing the road work for this book. And I don't know what to say. <laughs> you know, all I can do is confess that I've taken some and some of the experiences were good and some of the experiences were horrible. Well, let but, me get uh, back to this notion of artistry as a way of being, and that through art, either as a participatory, you know, participating like in, at a concert or as an artist, that we have these extraordinary glimpses of being out of the map. Is that why artists, some artists, feel like they they have a compulsive quality of of needing to constantly create because of that, that urgency? You know. That uh, is an interesting idea. I certainly know what you mean because I, I'm sitting here going, I've written 16 books. I don't really need to write another one. But then I'll be, I'll be, in a way, I'll be bereft. You know, I'll be, dep- I'll live in a kind of deprivation because, yeah. you know, artists know when they've done something that's a kind of extraordinary in that kind of the transcendental way that we've been talking about. They know it immediately, but it's not like they can make it happen every day, but Mm -hmm. they, you know, they want to get back to it. You know, how do I get back to that moment when I, when the viewers of the art or the people who listen or read, they're quite aware of it too. You know, if you're reading a Rilke poem and you come to lines about a visitation to God in which he, he feels you flying whitely about his face. It's a, it's a really intensely gorgeous religious poem that has absolutely no institutional relationships to religion. It's intensely spiritual poem, and that's about what Rilke liked to write. But um, Rilke is one of those writers who, poets, who is a favorite of Western Buddhism now, by the way. Everybody quotes Rilke. Yeah, um, yeah. But he's he's one of the few poets that seemed to be able to return to that moment, to that sweet spot, that sweet spiritual spot uh, at will. He did it a lot. But for the rest of us, it's sort of like, how do I get back there? I, I, I can't let go of it. You know, it's too it's too healing, too consoling, which is exactly what it is for the viewer. It, it, it reminds me of Dogen. Uh, where practice mm. is realization, the idea that mm. like when you are engaged in a project such as writing or whatever art it may be, there's this whole being kind of engagement with with the work. Right. And and it's not just the product, so to mm-hmm. speak. Yeah. I, I, I think 
I think in the West we think too much about uh, the, the only way is me- is meditation. And that's you know, what I was trying to get at earlier. Yeah, yes, is uh, the um, the only the only way to get to Satori is is through uh, years and years and years of practice on the on the cushion. So per- it's my, almost like there could be a, a performative aspect of awakening. Yeah. No, absolutely. Or and, social, uh, almost like a social virtuosity too. Peter uh, Hershock talks about that, that uh, uh, the Chan masters that were doing Cohen practice, of course, it was performative. You had to perform yeah. your insight. It wasn't just, mm-hmm. oh yeah, you know, like an academic giving the right answer out of some right. book that they studied. It's like, right. do you, are you really embodying this? And Well, show yeah. me. Yeah. Well, you know, it's. Fen- it, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned performance because that's one of the things that uh, I think uh, uh, a lot of attention has been paid to the chapters about corporate Buddhism in this book. That's what people ask me about, mm-hmm. but not much has been not much attention has been paid. It's almost as if they don't it's they don't see it um, to the fact that the book is uh, intended to be a performance. And I just got a I just got an email yesterday from a, a reader who said basically it was like and this just made my heart so glad. Um, it, it was like it was reading your book was like reading a novel because I I just had to keep finding out what came next because it, you keep you keep changing and I said that's, yes that's right that's um, exactly how I felt yeah yeah exactly yeah. yeah and so but there there you know uh, it's so rare uh right now to find a book that does that sort of thing and uh i, I do it knowing that I, that's based probably not going to be publishable i don't know who other than melville house would do it if melville house didn't exist but thank god it still does but you know i i came up with a model about 20 years ago uh, when i was doing the book uh, the middle mind and that and it was sort of my uh my political agenda and uh, people would ask me literally as if I, sh- I would know, what, are, what am I supposed to do about this situation? And, and I would say, well, there's three things that I try to do. The first thing I try to do is misbehave. <laughs> I try to misbehave. I try not to do what I'm supposed to do. And I would say, this book is written in the style of misbehavior. <laughs> yeah. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is that I try to make something beautiful. Who know, you, you, who knows what beautiful means? I don't know. You know, you you may not know exactly what it means, but you know what it feels like. Mm-hmm. And so, try to make something beautiful. In other words, an, that's an an invitation to a different way of thinking about the world. And the third thing I said was, try to win. Hmm. <laughs> try to win. It you know, it's a terrible formula for a revolution or a recipe for a revolution, but. Um, you know, there's something, there's something for me at least about it. You know, I'm always trying to win. I'm always trying to make the world more like uh, a reflection of the things that I see, you know, in Buddhism or in art or whatever. And God damn it, I think that's a, a legitimate thing to try to do, even if it's hopeless. Yeah, I think you embody this the Zen aspect of swimming upstream to the, the Chinese mythology of the Dragon's Gate is located at the top of a waterfall. Uh-huh. The Dragon's Gate and waterfalls cascading down the mountain, and carps are trying to swim upstream against the river's strong current. And not many can, or capable, or even you know brave brave enough to to make that final leap. And but this one carp kind of successfully makes the jump and transforms itself into a powerful dragon. And yeah, I, I think the. I think you've done that with this book, Transcendent. Thank you. And- I had a final thought, which is that, you know, Buddhism tells us uh, two contrary things. You know, there's this uh, famous story of about the Buddha arriving at a, at a Dharma hall in order to give a lecture. And he stands up in front of the crowd and he doesn't say anything, but he's he's holding a, a flower before him. And people, you know, he just stands there and people are going, why isn't the Buddha talking? You know, when is he going to start the lecture? When is he going to start the Dharma talk? And uh, finally, after God knows how many minutes, somebody in the audience goes, aha. (laughs) And, you know, it's sort of like when the Buddha said, one person understood. 
you know, it's, it's sort of like your thing about how many people make it up the waterfall to the dragon gate, one. And that, that's that the Buddha, how the Buddha saw it as well. He, he didn't want to teach it first. That's right. He didn't want to teach it first. He said it was too hard. And then right. the, the Brahma said, uh, uh, well, you know, there are some people with only a little bit of dust in their eyes. And you, can, right. you, should, you should teach them. And, the, and that, at that moment, the Buddha decided to do it, even knowing that most people were not going to understand what he said. Mm-hmm. So that's one, that's one side of it. The other side of it is that arriving or awareness, waking up, is, is always right here, right now. It's that flower. That, everybody saw that flower. Everybody could have woken up. Curtis White, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. It was a great fun. This is the Mindful Cranks podcast. I hope you like our new look and feel. And check out our webpage at www.mindfulcranks.com. And subscribe to the Cranks newsletter to learn about upcoming guests and other events. The Mindful Cranks is pretty much on every podcast platform. Please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you are so inclined. That's it for now. I'll be back soon with another amazing guest. Thanks for listening.